Now that we've identified consumer and producer surplus in our market diagram, we can draw the picture that you're probably familiar with from a previous economics class. In the market for the good X, we have a downward sloping market demand curve and an upward sloping market supply curve. Together, they form the equilibrium price. And at that price, consumers get the surplus above that price up to the demand curve. So that creates consumer surplus here. And firms get the surplus below the price down to the supply curve, our producer surplus area. So together, they split the total surplus in the market. And how exactly they split it depends on the relative elasticities of demand and supply. We can draw a very similar picture for a different market. We can put labor on the horizontal axis and the price of labor or the wage rate on the vertical axis. In this case, the firms would be the demanders. Firms demand labor. And consumers choose between consuming or leisuring and whatever leisure they don't consume, they end up working. So from the consumer model, we get the labor supply curve. Together, those create an equilibrium wage with the area above that wage up to the demand curve being producer surplus because firms are the ones who are demanding labor. So this would become producer surplus. And the area below the wage down to the labor supply curve would become worker surplus. We could call it consumer surplus, but let's just call it worker surplus. So a worker might be willing to work for this wage, but actually gets to collect this wage. So that worker would get this much surplus. We can add those all up. So in both cases, the total surplus gets split between two different sides of the market. Now there's one thing to be careful of, which we pointed out when we derived consumer surplus in the market picture. The demand curve in this diagram is not equal to the marginal willingness to pay curve unless we've assumed that tastes are quasi-linear in the good X. So it, this picture is technically correct only when we've assumed that consumer tastes are quasi-linear in X. Then the picture works perfectly, otherwise it becomes more complicated. The same is true in this case. The curve that comes from the consumer model has income and substitution effects. But the curves we use to measure surplus only have substitution effects. So this labor supply curve, just like this demand curve, contains income and substitution effects unless there are no income effects. And the only way there aren't any income effects is if we've assumed quasi-linearity in the good that's on the horizontal axis. So in the labor case, it would be the good leisure. So unless tastes are quasi-linear and leisure, this is actually not the right curve to measure worker surplus on. It's only when we assume that tastes are quasi-linear and leisure that this becomes the compensated labor supply curve, which is the correct curve to use for measuring worker surplus. So the green curves in the two pictures, the demand curve in the picture for goods, the supply curve in the picture for labor, come from the consumer model, where we have to be careful about whether income effects are important enough for us not to use the labor supply curve or the consumer demand curve to measure worker surplus or consumer surplus.